As lawmakers' investigations into unidentified flying objects looms overhead, many might be asking, what does this all mean? Hill opinion contributor Merrick von Rennenkamp, who also served as an analyst with the United States Department of State's Bureau of International Security, makes the case that the UAP saga could lead to two conclusions. Either the United States government has mounted an extraordinary decades-long cover-up of UFA, UFO retrieval and reverse engineering activities or elements of the defense and the intelligence establishment are engaging in a staggeringly brazen psychological disinformation campaign. He writes this in The Hill. Merrick von Rennenkampf joins us now to discuss. Welcome to our show. Thanks so much for having me back, guys. So, yes, we're, we've been talking about UAPs a lot lately, um, ever since uh, the David Grush interview. You know, why don't you tell us more about the, the potential for the, what you described as a psychological, you know, disinformation campaign? Um, what does that approach, if that's what go, what's going on, look like? And does, it, does that even have to do with, you know, what we're talking about now? Is, is, are we talking about this because of actions um, the, the government or the, you know, the people trying to either publicize this or bury it are taking? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, Robbie. And, and from my perspective, and I'll just zoom out a little bit and, and take a maybe a, a 30,000 foot view, um, there are certain facts in the story that I think we can we can all agree on. And, and from my perspective, those facts lead to two, either, either two extraordinary conclusions. And again, one is that there's this decades long UFO retrieval and reverse engineering effort, or two, that there is a disinformation campaign. That's just the way I see the facts as they stand leading, those two kind of paths. And um, as far as the disinformation campaign, um, boy, you know, I, I don't know what the motivation would be. Maybe it's to, to fool our adversaries into thinking that we have some remarkable technology in our possession. You know, I, I don't know what to what end. I, I suspect that would be, I'm not a lawyer, but I suspect a massive disinformation campaign along those lines would be illegal. Um, you know, that's intentionally targeting potentially U.S. citizens. Um, and so there are reasons to, to be skeptical of, of that. Um, but that's th those are the two options that I'm coming up with. And I'd love to hear alternative takes and, and different theories. But that's that's the conclusions that, that I'm coming up with based on the facts as, as I understand them. Well, I think the argument for a disinformation campaign is that one, it could be an effort to uh, distract from other kinds of news stories that are less dis, uh, less advantage uh, advantageous to either or both establishment parties. Um, I don't think that the deep state, I think people would argue, is particularly concerned with whether or not the actions they take are legal. There, of course, have been efforts to promote certain kinds of art and culture in the past. Uh, for example, in the mid part of the last century, uh, representational art was disfavored as, as an effort by the CIA in, in favor of um, abstract art because representational art was seen to be kind of Soviet and advancing people's movements and uh, valorizing the proletariat as opposed to abstract art, which had fewer narratives. So that certainly is not a thing, that kind of social public manipulation is not beyond the reach or the historical choices of the U.S. government. But I guess on the other side, people don't want to prematurely discount what could be an incredible revelation if it is substantive and real. So what is the best evidence in your mind that the timing and, co and quality of the revelations that have come out of late are not connected to a misinformation campaign from the government, but are coming out now because of other kinds of reasons that are more credible? So a great, great lead up and great question, Brianna. I, I think from my perspective, I've followed this very closely. It's obviously a fun topic to look into. And from my perspective, this all started in 2007 when Harry Reid, Senator Harry Reid, started up um, a fairly um, secretive UFO analysis program. And that is the genesis, that, that, that story is culminating with what we're seeing today. So I'm not sure this is a planned, this is happening now for a particular reason. I, and I wanna kind of maybe get into the really the nuts and bolts of, if we're, if we're thinking this is a disinformation cam, the nuts and bolts of this are that we understand, and, and Grush said this under oath, that he had individuals who had, who claimed firsthand knowledge of these UFO retrieval programs provide protected disclosure, that's a legal term, to the intelligence community inspector general. If you lie, if you willingly and no fully lie to the inspector general, that is a $10,000 fine and or five years in prison, 
maximum sentencing, right? So, so if these individuals are in fact part of a disinformation cam, they are willfully and know, knowingly opening themselves up to major legal jeopardy by uh, testifying to having firsthand knowledge to the inspector general. Uh, one thing that continues to frustrate me as we watch these interviews and we see these hearings is that there always seems to come a point where the where the witness, the the expert, the the person who says there is evidence out there, some evidence of crafts being re recovered, maybe even bodies or things pilots have seen that are pretty incontrovertible, but they'll say that. You know, this evidence is, is being held somewhere else or, or, or a person with more direct knowledge of it than, than me would like to come forward but can't come forward for various reasons because their job might be in danger so they're anonymous or there's some official somewhere who theoretically right has the the keys to the locked room where the actually recovered crafts are and what i want to know is, is why we, we never seem to get to the point where those people are being Unmasked. Like we, you know, we talk a lot about censorship on social media with respect to COVID, with respect to a bunch of subjects. And it's increasingly come out that actually the federal government, specific federal bureaucrats told Facebook and Twitter, we, we would like this content taken down. We would like this content taken down. We didn't know who those people's names were, but now we actually are learning who their names were. They're the comms people at the CDC and the FBI and the State Department and the White House. Um, how can we get what would it, what does it take to get to a point where we actually know the identities and can hold accountable of the people who are supposedly responsible for covering this up and preventing people from testifying? Robbie, the evidence question and what you are alluding to is is the key here. And what I would say, number one, is that Senator Rubio, um, vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, who has worked very closely on this issue, uh, has said that individuals fear for their lives if they come forward. So there's that. There's there's that potential uh, hindrance for, to people coming forward uh, openly at this point. I think maybe we'll see more more happening. Uh, I've seen some chatter that the Senate um, will hold hearings that will have additional witnesses that may may I don't know this for a fact may have firsthand knowledge. But I want to I want to be very clear. Um, the individuals who have seen and spoken to or, or seen the testimony of these firsthand witnesses. Um, have responded in a fairly remarkable way. And um, I'm talking more most specifically about legislation um, that has now passed the Senate that is sponsored by Senator Schumer that is literally a carbon copy of Grush's allegations, right? It defines legacy program. It mandates, mandates eminent domain. So the government seizure of any recovered and retrieved UFOs and any bodies, alien bodies, they call it biological evidence of non-human intelligence. That is in federal legislation that has passed the Senate. So the individuals who have spoken to these, these um, it, people who have claimed firsthand knowledge um, have responded in a fairly remarkable way. And I, I, I think more people need to see what is actually in this legislation, understand the magnitude of it and the gravity of it. I do hear that. I would also just point out that, for example, after the Warren Commission investigated RFK, uh, sorry, um, uh, JFK's murder, they were supposed to release those files, the last of them, by 2017. We're still waiting on that to happen. Having legislation that dis dictates disclosure doesn't necessarily mean that we're actually going to get those disclosures, especially when there's caveats like you don't have to disclose it if it's against the security interests of the United States of America. So, you know, we're still holding our breath. I think both Robbie and I very much want to believe uh, hashtag Roswell, <laughs> hashtag uh, Scully Mulder, uh, but we're all still just really hoping that evidence comes out. But let me ask you about this. Um, UFOlogist Jeremy Corbell weighed in on what uh, the public should be feeling about flying objects, let's take a listen. You said put on your tinfoil hats. People should put on their battle helmets. Right now, this is being taken seriously from the world public. It's a serious topic and people need to understand why it's a serious topic. Why to you is this uh, a serious topic, assuming that you, you agree with his framing there? Um, I, I think for the very simple reason that we've had multiple very credible fighter pilots, naval aviators, come out and say that they have encountered objects that are capable of, of flight characteristics that are well outclassing our most advanced fighter jets, right? We're talking about objects that can remain spherical objects that can remain stationary against hurricane force winds. No wings, no propulsion. We're talking about a tic-tac shaped craft that can literally accelerate to mock hypersonic speeds 
on a, at the drop of a dime. That's that is no technology that we have now or will have it in any any foreseeable future. So I, I suspect just from a very basic national security level, this is this is a remarkably important issue, right? When we have that kind of technology apparently out there. And, and the second point is a basic safety of flight. We've had Ryan Graves, Lieutenant Graves has, has spoken quite a bit about this. He testified before Congress. We've had near mid-air collisions with these objects in our military working areas, in our training areas, right? And that's not where we, by the way, that's not where we test top secret um, new secret technology. That this is very regimented airspace that is closely controlled. And when when fighter pilots are training for combat or, or for anywhere else, every inch of that airspace is controlled, and we know exactly. We should know who's in operating that airspace. So it's, we we can't say that that in those particular instances instances we're we're dealing with our own technology. Merrick, very insightful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Tomorrow on Rising, we'll be back with more cake, more Dungeons and Dragons. I don't think so. I only get one birthday a year. We don't have to do this again. Uh, your birthday's coming Mine's up, next though. Tuesday. We will absolutely recognize that. Uh